And we are live with Elizabeth Off Sovereign. Elizabeth is an independent minister, a spiritual teacher, and a mystic with interfaith expertise specializing in ascension of consciousness. She's the founder of the Sovereign Way, and and it's it's beautiful. And I'm glad to have her on my on my show. Welcome, Elizabeth. Thank you, Shay. Thank you. It's good to be here. Great. How are you today? And uh, and and could you tell us about the Sovereign Way right away? <laughs> sure. Well, for your first question is the most profound. I am fine. <laughs> Thank you for asking. <laughs> I'm doing great. I feel happy. I feel hopeful for the future. I feel excited about where the world is going and what we as a collective humanity are doing together. Um, I feel stronger every day. I feel healthier every day. Um, and I feel incredibly peaceful. And um, uh, what's more, Shay, I see people around me also sharing that experience. So I know it's not just me in my little isolated enlightenment cave who's enjoying the goodness. I know that this is something collectively that's spreading and that is just, that just makes me want to celebrate. So to your first question, I'm doing fine. Love it, thank you. <laughs> and to your second question, what is the sovereign way? Um, I'm gonna try and not be too verbose and not put too many words in here, which is difficult because I do love words. Um, but the Sovereign Way is an independent ministry. It's a unique ministry with a unique message that combines the structure of traditional religion that speaks of deliverance and salvation with a modern understanding of collective consciousness and universal energy. And it brings the the beautiful ancient teachings that we have of, of who we are in this world and what's really going on here. And it brings it into a modern day language where we can see ourselves and know ourselves as held in Christ as we ascend. And uh, it was born actually from my own experience. Oh no, she's off, she's bloviating. Um, it was born. It was born. That was my next question. You just, you beat me to it. How, how, how did it come about? And what does it involve, I guess? Yeah. All right, well, it came about, um, I'm, again, I'm going to challenge myself to be fairly succinct here, but I had my first um, transcendental experience when I was three years old, and I was climbing on all fours up the staircase at home, and I suddenly realized at the top staircase, at the top step, step um, I realized that I was thinking, and then I realized that I was thinking about thinking. And that made me realize that I was thinking about thinking about thinking and thinking about thinking about thinking about thinking. So that was me getting into metacognition for the first time and really learning meta view. So I knew that I'm obviously not these thoughts because I'm thinking about thinking about them. So who then am I? Uh, and I became then metacognitive or some people call it clear cognitive. Um, or clear cognizance, which is just really it's just the ability to bring your awareness into divine mind and to be a participant and a synthesizer and a formulator of what is known. Um, I had my first IQ test when I was five years old. And from that point on, I, I understood that I was neurodivergent. I had a different kind of way of processing than most people. Um, and with this acute kind of visceral and known sense of the, of the presence of divinity, I knew God, I had God, I was God in some sense. Um, I, uh, that was where my passion was going. So I'm bringing this particular peculiar way of thinking into this passion about who he is, who is God and, and what does it mean? Um, and my father, bless him, did the best he could trying to explain to me, age six, what it must be like for a two dimensional being like Donald Duck to be kidnapped by a four dimensional being like Donald Trump and placed into this reality. What would that be like for Donald Duck? What would he still be two dimensional or would he would he woof into another? How what would happen? And so I was asking these questions about multi-dimensionality and, and ascension, basically, although I didn't realize it then. And um, the churches didn't know what to do. 
In fact, my priest aged, when I was 14, my priest kicked me out of confirmation classes because of my questions about, well, if the serpent was already in the garden, then that must mean that counterforce or evil is an idea in the mind of God, surely, which means it's something we need to navigate, not something that we need to feel bad for, right? Well, that got me kicked out. And, uh, and so there we go. So I was experiencing then that there wasn't really um, there wasn't really a space or a format for high thinkers to come into deep communion with God. And so intellectuals are often marginalized. Intellectuals are often, often um, villainized and moved out of the spiritual conversation. You can't think your way to God, they say. You need to get out of your mind, otherwise you can never know divine presence. And that's not true. That's not true. Divine mind, genius, is a gift from God. And if you're somebody with a linear mind and you need to think about things and you wanna grasp things and you wanna analyze things, then um, <laughs> then that is your gift. That is that is how he's speaking to you, right? So, so the, I was getting oh, I was getting a little bit revved up here. And, and and by the way, Shay, I was a little English girl living in a small mining town in Norway. And so your spiritual options were: do you either believe in uh, this this cartoon version with the with the friendly man with the long beard? <laughs> And the, and the lightning bolts, and he blesses these guys, and he judges these guys, and he has a magical son. <laughs> Do you believe in that? Or the alternative is nothing. Mm. It's all just an empty mistake. And this is all an accident, and you are empty and meaningless, and you don't matter. Which one is it? Are we gonna go, are we gonna go for the cartoon version, or are we gonna go for the nihilistic atheist view? And I couldn't accept it, Shay. I couldn't choose. I couldn't choose because I knew a better way. I knew there was something else, but I wasn't satisfied. I wasn't fulfilled. And so I ended up going down the occult path. Right. I ended up going into mysticism, yeah. um, but I had no mentor. I had no structure. I just started unlocking energy in, in, a, in a different way, in a new way, and moving and manipulating energy in a way that was ultimately destructive to me and to many people in my life as well, actually. And, um, uh, and that kind of went on until I first discovered, uh, here in Sarasota, Florida, um, I discovered that there were ways of, of, of learning and training and mastering your relationship with vibration. So now I was in mental mastery and now I'm in vibrational mastery. So I've got genius and I've got magic. And I'm trying to bring genius and magic together in a way that makes sense, given the fact that I have this innate yearning for God and these questions about ascension. I'm still wondering about Donald Duck and Donald Trump. What would it be like? What is what is transdimensional ascension is what my little little five year old girl is still wanting to know on the inside. Um, and so. Um, and meanwhile, meanwhile, Shay, um, I've always considered Jesus as a master teacher, yep. as an ascended master, as a, a great healer, a man of history, um, one of the pantheon of spiritual supporters, but I've never known him as a Lord and savior. Okay. That wasn't allowed. I, it wasn't allowed in my belief system. And so I'm still kind of practicing and working these, these spiritual ideas and, and aligning my genius in such a way that I'm actually developing I'm beginning to, to develop a modality, to develop a path that converges the intellectuals and the mystics that are so often excluded from spiritual conversation. I went to many different churches and I was told higher spiritual gifts, supernatural mastery, these are demonic activities. Mm. And these people were ostracized and these people were thrown out of church and they were told they're not allowed to participate in spiritual thought. In, in good Christian conversation because they know too much, they're meddling too much. Um, and so I'm still unfulfilled after all these years. So, so, so you turn to both the, the, mystic, the mystic school separate from the church and then you went to a variety of different churches. So was that simultaneously or uh, did you sort of alternate between the two? How did that process look and how old 
were you when this happened? Um, so now we're talking about a period of time from when I'm um, now about 20 until, you know, fairly recently, until the Sovereign Way was, was, was fully formed and born. Um, and, and God, actually, I live a very surrendered life. So I move very freely where I'm brought. Uh, and, and then I absorb what I'm presented with. And I, I use that to build in my consciousness and my energy. And then I move to another place. And I don't personally subscribe to consciously architecting and designing my life. I don't do that. I don't have my vision boards and I don't design everything the way I want it. I allow, I just allow things to occur. And so I'd find myself apprenticing with a spiritualist school. Um, then I found myself uh, trained training for ministry within the spiritualist um, uh, modality of spiritual thought. Then I'm mentoring with the Lutherans and then I'm studying, I'm on the past to pre priesthood the path to priesthood with the Episcopal Church. Then I find myself with the evangelists. I find myself with the with the award-winning Qigong medical practitioners. And I find myself in these different schools of thought and vibration. And every time I try to commit to one of these, it's as if the plug is pulled and God closes the doors and say, no, no, you're not here to align with another lineage. You're here to form a lineage that brings together the intellectuals and the mystics in Jesus name. So now I'm asking in Jesus name, what do you mean in Jesus name? You know, why not, why not Krishna? Why not Lakshmi? Why not, you know, insert blank? Why, what's the thing with Jesus? So, so God then takes me and my husband and my children on this wild ride through Colorado. First we're dematerialized. He takes away our income, he takes away our car, he takes away our house, he takes away all our contacts until we find ourselves actually living in a, in a canvas tent pitched out on the raw, rocky land out back in Delta County in, in Colorado. We've got nothing left. And in that state, he pours onto us this incredible abundance both from nature, apricots and lavender and crystal ice melt water, um, but also an abundance of, of love, of energy. As suddenly people rush in to elevate us and, and, and we become truly delivered from all of the ties that bound us to who we thought we were before. And in this space, Jesus begins making himself known to us in a very visceral, real way as a savior not just as one of the many in the pantheon of sub-divine reality, but an actual savior, an actual mechanism of the universe that delivers you from the ties that bind. And not only that, but the very heart, the very throne of love. And so I'm, I'm getting to know this dude in a whole nother way. I'm still thinking about this from a meta point of view which is what I needed to be able to get deliverance. I needed to intellectualize, understand and synthesize what this strange new magic is. Um, because this isn't vibrational mastery. This isn't me using energy to manipulate what I want out of life and create these realities that my ego thinks I want. This is something altogether different. This is something so deep and so powerful and so personal that I, I just can't put words to it. But I'm. I'm still in the meta view of this, right? I'm thinking about, thinking about, thinking about, thinking about, thinking about deliverance. But in that space, it gets me able to actually create some very easy linear representations of what deliverance is. And it's only then, when I've actually done that, that I get it. And then when I get it, it's like it sinks into my bones in a whole new way and my entire energy field shifted. Suddenly now I feel like I'm walking around in his halo. Like there is this very real alchemizing effect of being in my biofield for me and for those who come into this presence. It's his presence. Now, I, my, the old me would say, well, that's my electromagnetic uh, output, you know, which is increasing because of my mastery and my ascension. But the truth is it is his halo. And so then I begin to know him in a very personal way. Now, suddenly he's not just this universal mechanism of the collective mind. Now he's a friend. Now he's a companion. Now he's someone that 
I can do life with. And, and he knows me in a very personal way. He knows how to communicate with me. He knows how to draw my attention hither or thither. He knows how to fill me up and how to heal me and comfort me in, in, in my unique little way. And suddenly this little four-year-old girl who had been so ostracized and so excluded from all these different realms of spiritual thought, suddenly this little girl is full to the brim. And, uh, uh, and it, it all came out and it was all produced as a cosmology, a way of, a way of interpreting life, reality and God and our relationship, the relationship between the little me and the great big I. And this cosmology allows us to arrange our thoughts and our feelings in such a way that we have an, a logical, ontological and sequential way of embodying the masteries that it takes to hold sovereign poise in a turbulent world using genius, magic and Jesus at the same time and converging these three things, neither one to the exclusion of the other. No one is ostracized or alienated for being a brilliant mind or for having the vibrational mastery that it takes to actually be on the great commission that Jesus sent his apostles out to demonstrate the power of God, to hold and embody the power of God, the power of creation not for my own egoic desires. I will have a book deal, and I did, within weeks of putting that manifestation out. I got a multinational book deal, but that sort of thing, you know, that, that sort of magic is so fleeting and it's so shallow and you find yourself still thirsty afterwards. But the kind of magic that Jesus offers is a wellspring of eternally life-giving water that never runs out. And honestly, I haven't been thirsty in years now, which is just super, super cool. So that's that's how it came about. And I think I broke my promise to keep no, it. No, that was that was beautiful. And thank you for walking us through that journey. That was that was inspiring, captivating, and 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 stirred something wonderful. We can sense your presence and so many questions, not sure exactly where to start. So I guess. You mentioned a personal relationship with, with Jesus as a savior and how that came about when you were in Colorado, if I heard correctly, out in the in the wilderness or in in a yeah. tent. How, yeah. So so how did that happen and how did what did that what does that personal relationship look like? So first how that happened and then what it looks like right now. And thank you. This is this is fascinating and beautiful. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. Well, yeah, the um the, the personal relationship was beginning to cultivate when we were out in the desert in Colorado. You know, when you've been stripped of everything you know, and you're just this naked, vulnerable lump of flesh surrounded by a canvas tent, and there are mountain lions and bears and coyote all around you. The, the whole landscape is, is, is almost barren, but also aggressive. Um, and you have to know yourself, not as being dependent on culture, and not as being dependent on nature either. You need to be able to detach yourself from both culture and from nature, because if you're in nature and of nature, well, then you're fair game to a mountain lion. So you need to actually, you need to bring yourself even out of that system of thought and into grace. So that was, so living in grace, living in the kingdom, was how we, we, we stayed not only safe, but utterly thriving during that really strange time in the desert. So that was when that personal relationship began to be cultivated. But I still didn't know him as a savior because he hadn't saved us, right? We're still trying to figure our way out of this mess we'd found ourselves into. He hadn't saved us yet. Until, and <laughs> Shay, this is such a long story. How shall no, I bring I it back? But until I love it. Uh, let I love, me... I've loved every minute of it, but yeah, I will try and keep an eye out on the time. We still okay. have at least 25 minutes to go or almost All right. a half hour. Well, half here hour. we go then. So the, the way savior was manifest as a particularized reality in my life was when he paid off a hundred thousand dollars in bad debt, including interest, 
including fees, saved our house out of foreclosure and then doubled the equity in our house, gave us a business that was super profitable. All of that in the span of one year because we asked him to come and be our savior. So that absolutely mind blowing experience of deliverance is more than just a psychological idea, uh, idea. It's not just this ideation of a magical man who loves me no matter what. We're talking about very real, a very real manifest experience of being delivered from that which you couldn't transcend on your own and plopped into a reality where everything is high resolution, where all of those ties that bound you before are dissolved by his mercy. That was how like, I finally knew, wow, he's not just someone on my tarot cards. He's actually my savior. And, and everything changed from that point on, I tell you. So, so you said you, you, you'd already prayed to Jesus. So there was already an idea or a feeling. So you'd already turned to uh, Jesus, not quite as a savior, but, but it sounds like in a sense as a savior. And, and how exactly did that look in the, in, in the physical world for, you know, the uninitiated to, to understand in terms of the, the brick and mortar part of paying off your uh, debt and setting up the business. And... So you mean, how did he do it? How did he do it? And I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll stick to one question at a time. Sorry, there's just so much and it's so interesting. But yeah, how did he do it first, yeah. I guess? So how did he do it? So I, I, will, I will tell you how he did it. But I will preface it by saying how he did it is irrelevant because how he did it for me wouldn't look anything like how he'll do it for you. But but yes. So so the experience of deliverance will show itself in your life in very real manifest ways. So things are occurring. There is something going on here in the particularized reality that we're all engaging with. Um, we ha I had known Jesus all my life, but I'd known him first as that cartoon character. Then I'd known him as uh, as a nice idea and a silent conversation partner in my in my moments of, of anxiety and and fear. I'd known him as an ascended master, as a as a one who accomplished the thing that we think we're trying to accomplish. I'd known him as as someone who shows up on the tarot deck cards or in the, you know, in the in the spiritual memes on Facebook and stuff like that. I'd known him as, as, as one of the many. Um, I had begun to get to know him a little bit better as, as love embodied during my time apprenticing with the different Christian churches. But the problem there was that there, was, there wasn't the food that my mind needed. My mind needed to ask questions that there were just no answers for. Like, why is he really different? What is so different about him, really? Aren't we all children of God? Aren't we all part of that same universal field? What's so special about this guy, really? Let's be honest. And um, and the answers I got never fulfilled me. It was usually just, well, just believe. <laughs> Don't ask questions. Just believe. And I, I couldn't. I couldn't do that fast food love and light spirituality. Yeah. Um, when it came down to asking him to release us, to, to finally come to him as a Lord and Savior and release all idea that I needed to be the architect or the master of my life, that I could, in fact, just humble myself into a divine providence that is moving through me anyway. At that point, when we had tried for years to solve this problem of financial ruin you know we lived in a tent in the desert there was no way we were making payments on a house that was thousands of miles away right yeah. um we my husband and I came together and we prayed Jesus help us with this deliver us be our lord and savior if you say you're the lord and savior show it show us do the thing within a couple of days of of making this powerful prayer together a piece of paper shows up in the post and it says, hi, we're a third party provider and we help people who have um, been through financial ruin and maybe we can help you with your mortgage payments. And we thought, yeah, right, but I guess, you know, sometimes you just have a stirring that this, this particular envelope, you're gonna open it this day. Normally you'd throw in the recycling, but today I'm gonna open it. 
Um, we phoned up the number and they said, yes, you qualify. They took us through this extremely unlikely series of questions. And, um, uh, and they said at the end, you do qualify, but your debt to income ratio is completely skew if we can't, no one's going to underwrite this thing. You made, you made 300 bucks in April. Who's going to lend, who's going to sort this problem out for you? Um, so in, in order for us to push the button on this, you need to make $6,000 in May and $6,000 in June. And we, we were like, $6,000. I don't even know how much that is. Like how many zeros are there in 6,000? I can barely, con I can barely, you know, contemplate the idea of having a hundred at this point, you know? Um, but she goes, well, say la vie, that's how it's going to be. But I tell you what, Shay, when, when you're on the phone with God, right? And God is saying, here's the thing you prayed for. Now you need to do this impossible feat in order to receive it. You know, you can do the impossible feat. You know, you can do it. So we said, all right. And, um, and as soon as we'd said yes, things started to shift. Clients started showing up. People were asking questions. People were saying, how do I cross a spiritual threshold in less than five weeks? How can I get through this impossible barrier that I'm in in less than five weeks? Can you help me? And all of a sudden, this business just bloomed. It just burst out of nowhere. And we, we, we hit the deadline on the May. We, made, we had $6,002 at 10 o'clock at night on May the 31st. And we celebrated for about half an hour until we realized, shit, we've got to do it all again. And we did it again in June. And she goes, all right, push the button. And the next thing we know, $100,000 in bad debt has vanished. And there are no penalties and there are no fees and all the interest has gone. It's as if it never happened. And that's the secret of Jesus's mercy. It's as if it never happened. When he takes away your sins, your iniquities, your errors, your paradigms, those intergenerational curses, those strange agreements you've made, the covenants and contracts you've made with lesser parts of life, he whoosh, dissolves them all as if it never happened. That's what's so super magical. So, and then it just so happened it coincided with an incredible boom in real estate. So the next thing we knew the house had doubled in equity. So there we were, and we, uh, literally almost overnight, we went from being financially ruined, drowning in debt at imminent risk of foreclosure. And then just a moment later, now we're wealthy and we're debt free. And we're, we've been given this business that's working so beautifully well, saving lives, might I add, teaching magic, teaching genius. And, and the, uh, <laughs> and the old me would say, well, you know, it's magnetism, it's it's mastery, it's it's architectural design. But it was none of that, Shay. I cannot take any credit. That was Jesus Christ doing what he does, which is deliverance. That's 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 beautiful. That's an inspiring story, but I could feel wow, that that was amazing. Thank you for sharing and and yeah. Wow, I'm I'm gonna ask for something right now, but I guess it was a process of surrender. It, it took a, a period of of study of, of so it still sounds like it was intense faith, but it was built over time through your mind and through being exposed to various churches and coming to your faith. But to me, it seems like you built the faith through your intellectualizing and through working with different churches. Is that is that fair to say or? That was a piece of the puzzle, yeah. Um, and I think that's one of the one of the side effects, one of the symptoms, perhaps, of having of having a particular kind of mind that processes the way that mind does. Um, my IQ is 140, which places me in a bracket of people who who think a lot, and um, and so I I had to resist a whole lot of stuff that didn't make sense. You know, I probably could have come into perfect faith a hell of a lot sooner if I hadn't been so insistent that I needed to figure it all out, right? Um, and, and the same thing, like um, practicing magic and getting into the magical aspect of life, the vibrational mastery and the authority of commanding element and time. Um, that was, I had to intellectualize that. So I needed to find ways of, of, of turning the esoteric and unrelatable into linear synthesis and formulation before I could truly get it. Um, and I had to live it. And that's why God took us out of 
our cozy little reality and had us go through this odyssey of financial ruin to the point where we were homeless twice living in the desert. I had to live these lessons. I had to eat it all and digest it myself. Um, but you're right, it was a period of time. And that's why I synthesized it all into the sovereign way so that you don't have to go through that ridiculous, <laughs> for saying so, that <laughs> it, incredibly intense training period, but you can actually receive the, the embodied truths that came out of that process. You can receive the masteries, you can receive the cosmology, and you can have the deliverance. And it's all in the sovereign way. So, so in a way, you're taking on the sins of, us in a, in a manner that's 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 similar to to to, to the, the story of, of Jesus himself but not quite in the same way I understand but in a in a similar in a similar manner if just maybe the degree of scale may be different but it, it sounds like a similar story and, and and I also wanted to ask how your your husband and you mentioned children how they tied into it and um, how how God spoke to them and how that helped you with with your journey and yeah oh those are great questions those are beautiful questions that I've never been asked before thank you um, you know yeah you know I think that um, there are many of us on this planet who are invited into an anointing to be a leader to be a pioneer a pioneer of thought a pioneer of vibration a pioneer of structure. Um, and, 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 and a leader is an intercessor, you know, Jesus was an intercessor. He took on the sins of the world and transformed those and redeemed us all from, from that energetic entropy that had us moving into disaster. He redeemed us all from that. Um, and I think in many ways, any leader who says yes to that anointing also functions as an intercessor and says that. I'll go first. I'll check if this bridge is safe. I'll go first. And then you guys can follow me if it's safe, right? So I think that there is an aspect of, of you know, Messiah in, in anyone who chooses a place of, of leadership in the world. Um, and that's why it's so important also to delegate your leadership to Jesus mm -hmm. so that I don't actually have to, I don't actually carry any of the burdens of my students and my community or my clients. I don't carry any of their weight. But when they come into my field, they feel that weight, bur that burden lifted. But it's not because of me. It's because I've already placed myself into his messianic field. Right. So there's that aspect of it. And then your question about what my beautiful family, um, uh, what they thought of it all. Well, my husband is a superstar. He was out there um, in the desert. He with a pickaxe. He was terraforming. He was creating space out of the wild mountainside for us to pitch our tent on. He was creating waterways for the ice melt to reach the, the water fountain. He was building a kitchen out of dirt for us to cook on. He was there physically manifest present in the challenge. Um, and I was so grateful for that because I'm a very cerebral person. So I spent a lot of time in mind just trying to like analyze what on earth is going on here. Um, but to have a companion in faith, I think, is just so is a beautiful gift that not everybody gets to enjoy. And I realize I've been very blessed to have to have my husband as a as a fellow journeyman, you know, on this strange, strange journey. My kids have been fantastic. You know, they were quite young when we found ourselves in that mess. They were six and two. Um, and so they went, went through the whole thing with us. Um, who they are now is they are sovereign. They are uniquely sovereign people. They are very much themselves. Um, they hold a very specific kind of power and presence in, in their communities. They know what their gifts are and they use them. They have their own version of spirituality. We, we pray together, but not in the same way, because each one of us has a different relationship with God. And as sovereign, that's allowed and it works. And there's still a harmony between people interacting in their own, holding their own sovereign spirituality. And I'm convinced that that's the future of spiritual thought is sovereignty. And so that's why it's just been wonderful watching my children grow up in a household that is highly spiritual, 
Um, but that there is no conformity necessarily with any particular modality. My youngest daughter has a really close relationship with Jesus. He can find any piece of Lego in a giant box of thousands of pieces of Lego. He will find her the one she needs. It's amazing. <laughs> My oldest daughter has a different relationship. She doesn't really talk to Jesus as a companion. She's much more interested in the world. And she's out there in the world, speaking to people, through people, expressing her creativity, performing and being a butterfly in the world. And that's how she taps into, into who she is and where she's going. So I think that um, to sum it all up, your question was, how did they get on with it all? And, you know, the sovereign way is unique and personal to you. And so I can see the success of it in my husband, in my children, in all my clients, in all of my students, and everyone who comes into the sovereign community. I can see that it's working because they get to know God. They get to know themselves and it doesn't look the same for any of them. So that's how I know it's working. And my, yeah, my kids are cool. Perfect. It, it sounds, it sounds like a religion with with so much freedom to develop and cultivate your personal relationship with God, which is which, me feels like, like the future or or the path, like intuitively it just feels like an amazing path towards uh, ascension. And and in terms of that, just to clarify, what is in common? There are twelve. Um, there are a series of principles or, or or sets of rules, commandments, not quite, but there's there's something everyone agrees on. So if you could talk to 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 what those are and before that, how they came about, were they channeled? Was it still um, was it a voice you heard or how exactly did they come about? And if you could briefly talk about what those uh, 12, um, I think there were 12, if I remember, what yep. those are. Yeah. Yeah, there are twelve. Yeah, um, I will. I will let. Um, I will let you and any viewers go and explore each of those twelve in in turn in your own time and way. Um, but I will say that every every paradigm or every modality is distinguished by its creative agreements. Right. So that's basically saying that in this space, in this in this container that we're creating here, we're going to set the parameters like this, and we're going to agree that the language we use and the assumptions that we use are in line with these with these parameters right so that's how that's how we then interpret so now it becomes a lens so now if we make agreement with these with these principles then we can look through the we can look at the world through that lens right. and if you believe in phenomenology which most people the, these days do phenomenology is this is the school of thought that says that we are creating as we believe Right. You have an idea, you believe something, and then you will see that in form. Most people agree that that's true. Most people agree yeah. that consciousness precedes energy, which precedes form. Right. Well, if that's true, then choose to believe these things. And if you choose to believe these things, then your vibrational reality will manifest in this particular way. And you'll find yourself able to hold a mastery and a grace that allows you to realize deliverance, not just one time, not just hooray, Jesus paid off my house, not just that one time, but all the time, nanosecond by nanosecond, the ties that bind are dissolved, the errors that misguide you are dissolved, and the, uh, you overcome karma forever, and nanosecond by nanosecond, you are deliverance, walking. So that's, that's what will manifest through you if you believe in this circle, right? If you believe within this container. And that's not to say that, every other way in the world is incorrect. That's not it at all. This is just saying this is this way. And this way is very graceful and very light. Amazing. And so it, it recalibrates our, our consciousness to be more in touch with our divinity is, is, is what I'm understanding. And, and anyone can get these 12 steps off your website and essentially be a practicing um, sovereign is there is there a term uh, so if i were to practice the sovereign way do i is there would i be called yeah sovereign? we 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 call it we call it sovereign master 
to be sovereign. a sovereign master. Yeah, and we we speak about mastery. We we say that the the choice to participate in in conscious enlightenment does involve mastery. Every spiritual path has mastery in it. But what makes sovereign unique is that that mastery is practiced within his field of mercy so that you're in Christ as you're practicing your ascension. And yeah, you can you can go to the website, read the principles, sink into them, immerse yourself in some of the video teachings on the YouTube channel and just really get to know the language and get to know the, the, the philosophy that, that allows this to manifest through you. Um, but if but if you like, Shay, I'm actually going to show you some cool things when it's time for sure, me to do yeah, this. Sorry, we're, we're almost at uh, it's, it's, it's 10 to noon and uh, you said you had to run. And I um, you know if you want to record the class separately, if that's possible, because talking with you is just just really interesting and really informative, too, about your process and how you got here and the faith. So um, I wouldn't want to do you a disservice by trying to squeeze it in in the next nine minutes if you have to go i'm, I'm happy to keep talking uh but you, you said you had a commitment in uh yeah. in the next day i can minutes. yeah i can um i can keep going through the class and end sure. if we do it let's do it now yeah okay sure whatever you, yeah that works. Right. okay because this actually demonstrates those 12 principles okay perfect and just uh yeah. real quick i was just wondering how many um say people and how long have you been doing it so just real quick about the sovereign way so it came about like when did it come about and how many um how, how much has it say grown in terms of the people or your community yeah well we're a, we're a fairly small community we're a small ministry or fledgling if you like if you like that word i do um <laughs> in in 2020 we birthed this thing and we brought it out into the world and that's when we started teaching classes in a very structured way. And we started bringing or attracting the people who needed this work. Um, <clears throat> it is quite popular in the space between the Christian world and the new age world. So we're a bridge builder between these two different languages. And we tend to magnetize people with who, are, who have either have high IQs or they're neurodivergent, or they are um, or they're mystics. They already participate with the, the mystical aspect of life. And they need to know Jesus in a different way. They they tend to be the ones who flock to us. Um, we have a, um, a fairly small group of uh, 650 all over the world who are interested and engaged with this work. Of them, we have 35 leaders, or spiritual leaders, also all across the world. And they're much more engaged with the study and the practice. And we meet together twice a week to practice metacognition, energy work, prayer and devotion, Bible study, and really get to know God, really get to know the living wellspring. Um, and um, uh, yeah, so that's, that's, that's how many and who we are. You know, they say that only 4% of people reach the, the realm of consciousness of unconditional love, which is that bridge between genius and mysticism. Uh, uh, right there is this little field called unconditional love and only four percent of people reach that place it doesn't sound like a lot but Shay that's actually thousands of people where you live who are prepared to love you no matter what and they're there so these people need ministering to as well and um, you know that's why I often say to people I, I love this little saying that there were two groups of people who were invited to the birth of Jesus. There were the shepherds, who were the noble leaders of the beloved's flock. And there were the three wise kings, or the three mages. And I think that the, traditionally, the ministries of the world tend very well to the shepherds and the flocks. And they're, very, and, and they're well taken care of, and so it should be. But increasingly, as our culture ascends in consciousness, there is a growing imminent need for ministry that's designed for the wise kings, for the genius sovereign mystics of the world, because there are more of us than ever. And we need ministering to. This is what I discovered in my whole, my whole life, was that there was no ministry that could guide us deeper into God. And so we were left floating around with our unanswered questions and our strange supernatural powers with nowhere to direct them. So 
Um, yeah, so that's who we are. So if you resonate with this, if this is you, then come and find us. You belong with us. There is a spiritual home for you. There is a religion for you. And yes, religion is a powerful word, but a religion is a structure. It's a structure that you can follow through the surface of the water and into the airy dimension above. So a religion isn't something to be feared. It is something that needs to be alchemized. And that's what we're doing here. That's, that's beautiful. It definitely, definitely resonates with me, and I'm sure, and I hope it resonates with a lot of people and whoever it divines they fi finds. And one, one last bit, just uh, before you get into the masterclass, I'm so curious about the four percent number and how you how you got that or where it came from. Yeah, sure. That is, uh, that was calibrated by Dr. David Hawkins, who's one of the best consciousness researchers. Uh, he had teams of thousands of scientists who did apply kinesiology tests and then they then they peer reviewed it. They double blind tested it. It's robust. He created a, a map of consciousness, which I'll show you in a bit, um, which actually helps us. Um, it helps us organize ascending attractor fields of energy, ascending logs of consciousness and also measure whether any manifest thing where that thing logs on that scale so you for example you could test your this cheese sandwich is this a high vibrational high calibrating cheese sandwich or is it not and you can measure that and then if it's not you can up calibrate that cheese sandwich that's what you know blessing our food does right, right. And so we can also measure uh, where is the, the culture, where is our, our different cultures, our different geographies on this scale, and where are we going? And as of, you know, that 4% figure that was calibrated in the 90s, Shay, I bet it's gone up because I know that things are changing. But that number 4%, so that comes from the book Power Versus Force, which was published by Hay House in 2014. Definitely look up the book, and I know I'm going to spend a lot of time with your with your twelve paradigms. And yeah, looking forward to the masterclass. Thanks for humoring me uh, so far and for answering all those questions. Uh, but yeah, it's all you. We'll uh, make sure you're pinned on the video, and we can start the the masterclass whenever you're ready. All right. Okay. So this is the masterclass. I'm going to teach you how to get deliverance. First of all, deliverance is a mysterious, merciful mechanism of God that instantaneously dissolves the ties that bind, the ties in consciousness, the ties in energy, and the ties in the world that bind you to a lesser reality than the one that you are ordained for. And then it brings you into a higher reality. So it delivers you into the kingdom that was designed just for you. And we're often resisting deliverance because we're so busy being badass, independent co-creators of my own reality, right? But this resistance softens when we understand the mechanism of what actually occurs metaphysically when we align with Christ. <clears throat> so today we're going to do some quick fire philosophy. And I'm going to give you some very powerful visuals to help you get the mystery of deliverance. And all of this information, by the way, and all of these mechanics are in the book called The Sovereign Way. So you can get the book and you can really digest this meaty, meaty goodness. But for today, we've got quick fire. All right. So be poised, be alert and choose to be present in this teaching and receive both knowledge and the vibrational transmission infused in what you are learning. Now, if you have some peppermint oil, go ahead and sniff some. You might as well. Mm. Just get some of that oil into your mind, into your brain, into your beautiful, beautiful body and stay alert and follow along. Are you ready? Yes, okay, here we go. First, basic principles of reality. The universe comprises three elements, only three, source, spirit, and substance. These three elements are distinct from one another, but they are nonetheless indivisibly whole. 
You are these things, whether you know it or not. You are source, which is knowing, consciousness, and love. You are spirit, which is power. It's basically love in motion. It's that strange unified field that combines us all. And you are substance, which is particle, particle reality. It's, it's what makes cheese sandwiches different from light bulbs, you know? Different configurations of reality are possible because source and spirit are made manifest in particularized reality. Now, how it goes is that so loving consciousness commands spirit to move reality. So the extent to which you know yourself as loving consciousness, that is the extent of your authority over manifest form. So if you embody the knowing of yourself and everything else as these elements and nothing else, that dictates your log of consciousness, your electromagnetism, and your spiritual authority over manifest form. Now, if you're watching this, you probably agree that consciousness presides over energy, which presides over form. So once again, loving consciousness commands and authorizes spirit to move substance. So the more love you embody, the higher your log of consciousness and the more authority with which you command the spirit to move the substance. For example, at 100% embodied knowing I am that I am, you can turn water into wine. At a 50% embodied knowing, you can turn anger into peace and guilt into gratitude. And a 0% embodied consciousness, you, you, it would turn you to despair and the particularized world of systems and shapes would overcome you. So the size of your triangle indicates the extent to which you have realized yourself as this trinity, right? So we have Father, we have Son, and we have the Holy Spirit right here. Now let's take that, so we're going to hold on to that, take that, and we'll say that, okay, well, if everything is source, spirit, and substance at once, then let's represent that here with this field, and let's call it God. That's everything right there. So if this is all knowing, then there's a very specific strand of that knowing that's drawn out and laser focused as your knowing. So this is all knowing and this is this is your knowing. This is Shay. This is Elizabeth. This is Mary and Jeffrey right here. And here we have this ceaseless power of creativity, right, spirit, constantly moving through your knowing. So I'm going to create your knowing here as a diamond. It looks like a prism because the human consciousness is to God consciousness the same as a prism is to the sunlight. It takes white light and it refracts it, doesn't it? So what is completely whole in God mind, in human mind, now has value. Now it has, you know, we've got a rainbow effect and then we've got judgment. Now we've got red is better than yellow and, and I don't like green and blue looks horrible on me. And we have all of these judgments, right? So the power of, of creativity is always moving through your framework of consciousness and it refracts into energy which matches what you know, right? So in, in here, in this diamond, are all the data points that make up what you know to be true about God, what you know to be true about you, what you know to be true about life and who you are in relation to it. So we've got all kinds of nonsense in here. We've got some cool stuff like I am beautiful and I am powerful. And we've also got some completely nonsense stuff like I can't do that and it isn't true for people like me. And these sort of creative agreements that we make, that we log into our consciousness. <clears throat> and some of this data is divinely installed. Some of it belongs to you and is yours to create from, like your core values, like what matters most to you and what makes you unique. But some of it is inherited culturally or epigenetically, or forced upon you by trauma or oppression. And some of it is just simple error in judgment. And some of it is gained through experience and wisdom and revelation. But you have a very specific framework of consciousness. It's a bit like a window in a cathedral, a stained glass window that is full of stories of your life. And the sunlight projects through that window and it projects those stories into manifest reality. So remember, remember the Trinity here. So consciousness is commanding spirit 
to move form. So now we have the adamantine particles, the, the God particles of your life are now taking shape to match what it says in your framework of consciousness is real. So reality is now arranging itself according to your vibrational footprint and your experience of life in the four dimensions of time and space matches that data that's projected, right? You're still tracking because you agree with all this. You already know it. You remember it all. So ascension is the process of, of and experience of clearing all of the false stuff in here. Okay, I'm going to get rid of I'm not worthy. I'm going to get rid of I can't do it. I'm going to get rid of, you know, failure is dangerous or success is dangerous. I'm going to get rid of all of this nonsense that has me creating again and again out here in the world. And so we make more space for, for this love and we bring more power and cohesion to the creative spirit that's flowing through us. Ergo, the more love embodied, the higher the log of consciousness, the more electromagnetic authority you hold over the natural elements and the greater the reality of God's will on earth as it is in heaven, the purer and holier your impact and the higher we all rise together. So you still with me? Yes, 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 yes. So what does it mean to rise? What is that? So let's look at the map of consciousness. This is inspired by Dr. David Hawkins. This is a linear representation of ascending logs of energy fields arranged on a scale from zero to 1000. Uh, based on your proximity to perfect truth. So it's inspired by the map of consciousness, which was scientifically discovered and constructed by David Hawkins and presented in his book, Power Versus Force. At zero, we have spiritual death and decline. We have a desperate nihilistic life view. There is nothing and there's no point. And at a thousand, we have perfect embodied knowing I am that I am. I am Christ. At 200, we have a neutral attitude towards life. Eh, you win some, you lose some, the sun will probably rise tomorrow. At, at 400, we have genius. At 500, oops, my ratio's off. At 500, we have love. At 600, we get mysticism. 700 and above is called enlightenment. Now, anything below 200 let's say you log at 175 which is jealousy or maybe 150 which is anger the because this is now this is an energetic attractor field right which looks like this right you you are an energetic attractor field and you're logging here below the level of neutrality the metaphysical laws of creation will will bind like energy to you and create a downward spiral, which is called entropy, or depression. When the collective, when we all log below 200, we have a downward spiral of humanity and that's what destroys civilizations. Anything above 200, same metaphysical effect, we have something called ascension. So ascension is the process of coming closer to perfect truth. Everything below 500 is linear consciousness, which means that over there is different from that over there. Everything above 500 is quantum consciousness. Everyone below 500 needs systems and rules and institutions to keep them safe. Everyone above 500 exists in a synchronized, beautiful, magical experience of grace. So we have synchronicity and quantum possibility ruling in, in these logs of consciousness. So ascension then is the process of purifying that framework of consciousness, deepening your knowing that you are source, spirit and substance, and so is everything else. And the Christed mindset at 1000 is already available in the collective because Jesus realized it perfectly 2000 years ago. So as we ascend up this scale, our vibrational reality improves because 
The higher the log of consciousness, the greater the electromagnetic attractor field, the greater the authority to influence manifestation. So at a thousand, you can walk on water. And at 50, you have very little influence and life is opposed upon you. Now, wherever your consciousness logs on this imaginary scale, it is always possible to make up any deficit in your capacity by choosing to say yes to Jesus Christ and following him. Because now you're not limited, your authority is not limited by your attractor field. Your authority is not limited by your capacity or your ability. It's only limited by faith. Another thing to notice is that the experience of ascension is not a linear climb up this ladder. I think, if, I think if you're watching this, you've probably been involved in some way with ascension and you know it's not a linear climb up a ladder. And nor is enlightenment a race to the top, right? Every vibrational reality manifesting at each level of awareness has a purpose in the symphony of God. Albert Einstein, for example, spent his whole life at 499. That doesn't mean he's not divine. It means the world needed his life in linear genius so he could formulate the mathematical expressions of the unified field to help us prove the existence of God. We needed him not to zoom up to 100 and burst into this transcendental bliss of, of universal oneness. We needed him to stay held within the guardrails of linear mind because that's what gave us that gift. And so we oscillate up and down this scale across different moments and in different aspects of identity and life. And, uh, but we embody wisdom as we go along and we participate consciously with our ascension. Our diamond consciousness matures and we experience a steadily improving life of increasing presence, power and possibility. Now, as just a, a fun little FYI, the sovereign way is a bridge specifically unifying the area of ge genius with the area of mysticism, because the experience, the true experience of sovereign life begins when your mental mastery and your vibrational mastery are fused with loving, surrendered devotion. Now, look at this. This is cool. No part of the scale is separate from God. This is God. God penetrates into the very deepest, darkest strata of humanity. This is a lovely bit from Psalm 139, verses 8 to 13. Listen to this. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. Isn't that lovely? So... We are not, we're not trying to escape the depths of humanity by climbing up this. God isn't waiting for us on the other side of your perfection. God is present in you right now. There's more. Can you handle some more? Yes, ma'am. Here we go. There's more. So since the precedent of God as fully embodied human already exists as a potential in our collective consciousness, perfectly realized into the collective 2000 years ago in the life of Yeshua or Jesus as we know him. You are always entangled with that possibility and always in, in proximity to it. So here you are, this is you going along about your life, you're participating in your ascension, you're doing your inner work and steadily the the nonsense that you'd made agreement with before is falling away and your life is becoming a little bit better but what you're creating is still a mixed bag and you still keep bumping into the the, the triggers that then have you living in a complicated feedback system where your limbic association triggers emotions which triggers thoughts which triggers feelings which triggers behaviors that are not in line with the kingdom and so for that reason this ascension by mastery is bringing you closer to that perfect diamond but 
It's an energy expensive and slow process. At the same time, the, the precedent that you're striving towards already exists and is entangled with you. And what's manifesting through you is a, is a mixed bag, but what's manifesting through perfect Christ mind is pure love. Pure love applied to what is not yet manifest is called grace. That's when suddenly something occurs, a quantum possibility occurs that you're not in vibrational resonance with, but it occurs anyway, that's grace. Pure love applied to what is already manifest, that's called mercy. So mercy alchemizes all things. That's the field of mercy. Mercy alchemizes what is already manifest and redeems it, brings it back to truth. So here you are walking your way, ascending by mastery. You're doing all the work. You're doing the prayer, the meditation, the shadow work, the breath work, the yoga. You're healing your ancestral wounds. You're reprogramming your subconscious limiting beliefs. You're closing karmic cycles all that stuff, blah, blah, blah. We're all a little bit bored of it by now. <laughs> Surely there's a better way. And as you're getting closer to that thousand points on that scale, the energy field of mercy is penetrating more of your manifest reality and you're experiencing more non-linear actualizations or miracles as we call them in the religious world. Now, there is a, a natural yearning in your soul to come deeper into God, but the metaphysical laws of creation keep you constantly exposed to energetic counterforce. Let's look at that one more time. Everything has an equal and opposite reaction, right? Einstein gave us that nugget as well. Everything has an equal and opposite reaction. So as you grow, you feel that counterforce pushing back at you, and it shows up in your Achilles heel. So you struggle to transcend your creative patterns. Right when you think you're doing so much better, suddenly that disease shows up or that relationship shows up or that thing that you've been trying to, man trying to transcend keeps manifesting. And you're like, are you here again? I thought I was done with this. How come I'm homeless again, right? So progress is really slow and it's really energy expensive because we get trapped in these feedback cycles uh, and, and we make more of what we've already made. So if you want to accomplish the perfect enlightened state by your own works alone, it's gonna take you 40 lifetimes of wandering in the desert. It's gonna take you 40 years of sitting in a lotus position, starving yourself in your enlightenment cave. There is a better way. It is possible to align your mindset underneath and within this pure Christed consciousness. That's what, this is what that looks like. So here we have that pure Christed consciousness. This is Jesus Christ. Here we have the wrath of God, that creative spirit that will never stop creating. Even if you're having a bad day, it's still gonna create. So we'll call it the wrath of God because it feels like the wrath sometimes. But, but, here is that pure, perfect, Christed consciousness. And remember what that, what that manifests? It manifests perfect love, pure love. And so what you've done now is that you've aligned yourself, your little mindset, underneath this one, thereby becoming reborn inside an energy field that is 100% grace and 100% mercy. There's no bit, there's no, there's no, it's not piecemeal. It is integral and it is whole. And you are now reborn inside of that field. This is the metaphysical effect of Jesus is my Lord and savior. Now that ceaselessly creative and powerful spirit that we, we decide to call the wrath of God. Now it's softened by an intercessor field. That's what Messiah is. It's an intercessor. It's an in-between stander, right? So now that ceaselessly powerful energy is moving through the intercessor before it arrives at your framework of consciousness to be colored by all of your beliefs, which means that the one who knows, the one who knows life, the one who knows you, and the one who loves you and adores you no matter what and wants you in his belonging. He is filtering that creative power before it arrives at all of your errors. 
not only that, but you're manifesting now inside this field of mercy. So everything in your consciousness, everything in your energy, and everything that in your form, everything that you're manifesting, including your body, is now bathed in this constant presence of 100% mercy. And all of that stuff is instantaneously neutralized. All of that, that complicated tangle of creative feedback that used to make up who you thought you were, all of that is released. Inside this field, you are utterly soaked in grace and mercy. And your ascension is now much more graceful, much more smooth, and it's safer to experiment and practice with the higher spiritual gifts and miracle work. Here's another little bit from the Bible. This is John 14, 20. And on that day, you will realize that I am in my father and you are in me and I am in you. He is your very halo. He is your very halo. So now the question is, how do you make the switch? How do you get to know this intimately and personally? And let me tell you, this isn't just feeling happy and bright and being an example of love in the world. This is a real communion with the living Jesus as a companion, as a, as a conversation in creation, as his function as Lord directs your motions and your movements and his function as savior alchemizes your energetic path and then when you when you go astray as we are wont to do on our oscillating journey he will bring you back into him when you've made that agreement with him he takes the lead as your beloved dance partner so how do you make the switch how do you do it what's the thing that you have to do it's a very simple three-step process it's in the bible Number one, you have to believe that this is possible for you. You have to believe in him because we create as we believe, right? So if you've decided in your framework of consciousness, if you've decided to place in here, in one of your creative paradigms, that I have a savior, guess what will manifest? Guess what will manifest? A very real savior who saves you when you're drowning. He shows up for you. So number one, believe it and you will see it come to form. Number two, speak it, proclaim it. Your word is your wand. You can tell a friend, you can join a group, you can find a mentor, you can you can be an apprentice to someone else who's walked this path. And as you engage in this conversation, you are speaking more power and more reality into he is my Lord and Savior. So that's the set. So step one, believe it. Step two, speak it. And step three, you have to allow it to be. That's the hardest part. You have to allow him to save you. You have to allow him to come into your life. You have, to, you have to open your heart to the one who is longing for you so deeply. And when he chooses you, you have to choose him back. So that's the hardest part sometimes for some of us is, is actually to allow it to have been done. So that's the thing. That's how you qualify. It's all, that's it. That, that's all it is. That's all he wants from you is your heart. Um, and it's as easy as that. So three simple steps. And you don't have to walk this way alone, by the way. If you've, uh, if any of this has resonated with you or you're curious to know any more about what the sovereign way is and how it works or who Jesus is and how he might be with you in your life, then follow along and support the sovereign way. It's a unique ministry. Come and join our community on Facebook. Watch the teachings on YouTube and just enjoy sinking into that rich vibrational transmission. And you can support us financially by buying the book, The Sovereign Way. Or you could also join our study group and get really, really intimate with this work. Or even send us a donation to help us grow. And you can do any of these things on the website, which is www.elizabethofsovereign.com. Thank you very much for joining this masterclass. Thank you. That was that was beautiful and really inspiring. And it I could 
I could feel the transmission definitely had tingles and felt your connection there. It was, it was, it was lovely. I definitely will, will do a lot of sitting and praying with, with your words and with your, with your wisdom. And it's, it's, it, it really spoke to, it spoke to various parts of me that the body was responding to and, and the heart was responding to as well. And, and, I guess I, I still have a few more questions, just the last few before you go, about the, the list and figuring out the exact, there's that analytical mind. I, I did consider myself uh, to, to, to be on, on, on somewhat of a similar um, path in terms of some of your students, I imagine, who tend to want to intel intellectualize or, or, or rationalize um, everything. And, and part of that led me to figure, to try and ask you where you are on the scale, where your students are, or where your husband is, and uh, or or your family, and uh, so 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 you would be at a thousand, or is that just Jesus's domain or Yeshua's domain, and 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 how would the average student that you get is just over five hundred, and how is that calculated in a in a tangible way? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, oh, oh, sorry, I almost clicked leave. I'm trying to. I'm trying to big the screen. Um, great question. Uh, to begin with, we did used to calibrate the consciousness of people who came in, but we found that, that quickly turns into an ego game. Mm. So we don't do that anymore. But I, we, we, I can say that the psychometric kind of picture of people who are drawn to the sovereign way, they tend to be geniuses or mystics. So they tend to live in that 400, 500 kind of realm. And usually the mystics come because they need more of the structure that the genius brings and the geniuses come because they need to get out of linear mind and into something a little more mystical, a little bit more magical. And so we build a bridge between those two fields of consciousness and everyone gets the best of both worlds. So that's how that works. In terms of, uh, in terms of a thousand, you know, a thousand is the full embodied, incarnated and integrated knowing that I am that I am, pure walking, talking love. And the avatars of the ages, Krishna and Buddha and Yogananda and Eckhart Tolle and all of these incredible avatars, they all log between 700 and, and 1,000. And then you have some, you know, some of the great minds like Lao Tzu or Mother Teresa that sort of log in between 600 and 700, where they have come to the realization of divine love and they have given themselves into the mystery of being in union with Jesus. But they're not necessarily needing the, the I am consciousness. They're very happy to be in the world, in the relation with linearity and duality. And in fact, that's where their great, great works are done. So um, me personally, well, I'm one of these people who oscillate up and down, you know, I wake up in the morning and I'm a, I'm a I'm a 150 because I'm angry because of something, right? But, but I have developed the mastery now to come into poise very easily, to come into that spaciousness of sovereignty. And from that point, you can choose again. And you can choose, now I'm going to interact in a very linear way with my genius. Or now I'm going to place all that away and I'm going to go into full devotion. And so I have a lot of freedom to participate with the different realities on that scale with ease because of what we call sovereignty. So I'm not locked into any any place on that scale. And, and the last two, two, so the three steps, if I'm not, I read a children's version of the Bible, a little bit of the Bible, but I'm not in any way well read on um, on Yeshua or, 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 or the, the way of the Christ. So, so how does one surrender without the knowledge? Is it primarily with the intention and, and the idea? And how does one um, believe fully in that sense? And I guess that's where your steps come in. But, but yeah, if you could walk me through surrendering without a full knowledge of the process. Yeah, I think um, um, from what I've discovered, the way you surrender is a very unique and personal conversation between you and Jesus. But ultimately, I think once we hear him, once there's a stirring in our heart and we recognize that he is inviting us into his way, that he has chosen us, and we get that stirring that 
I'm hearing something in a new way. I'm hearing a new thing in a new way and I feel stirred and, and you sense that he's, that he's chosen you. The thing you have to do next is choose him back and say yes to that. And that's what activates what comes next, you know? And I think uh, some of us, you know, like people like you and me, Shay, who are a little bit too genius for our own good, we probably need to go through a slightly longer process of figuring it out. Like, what does this mean? Does that mean I have to be a Christian now? Do I have to go to the church every Sunday? Can I not wear these clothes anymore? Do I have to stop reading my tarot cards or, or doing the things that I enjoy? Does it mean that? Um, and, and, you know, the truth is, that is entirely between you and God, what you need to release and what you need to embrace. That is entirely between you and God. But with Jesus as your partner, that dance that you do is embedded in a friendship, you know, and that's what's so comforting and so easy about this way. Um, so you don't need to have knowledge of the Bible at all. You know, did, did you know that 75% of the New Testament was written by someone who never met Jesus? You know, Paul didn't study with Jesus. He didn't study with the disciples. He received everything in a flash, a transcendental spiritual awakening when he was on his way to murder disciples of Jesus. On his way to kill the lot of them, King Jesus comes to him in the most extraordinary transcendental fashion, you know, and, and that's actually what's built the, the, the scriptures that we have today is the, the words of a sinner, the words of, of, a, of someone who never knew him. So, so that, that's a Gnostic kind of knowing, not an intellectual knowing, but, but a deep gnosis. So you don't need any kind of um, education. You don't need any training in the churches. You don't even, you don't need the sovereign way. You don't need anything, but your heart and your willingness to lean into him when he calls you. That's, that's beautiful. Now I've, I've, I've been drawn to the, the Gnosticism and the Gnostic way in the past, and it's, it's beautiful. And it, I think you really speak to that direct experience of God and, and you know, you, you definitely embody that that connection by by showing how you experienced it so so the, the other the other thing that comes to mind real quick and, and sorry let me know it's it's way past the time but um but we can we can definitely wrap this up soon um was i guess course of miracles was something that i felt was channeled and spoke to me is that um just what's your what's your take on that or how does that speak to you as uh as a way to to jesus or uh we'll take yeah, I think A Course in Miracles is a, uh, a very high quality path um, that will lead to the very same place. In fact, A Course in Miracle logs at just over 600 on that scale. So it's a, it's a high quality, high vibrational path that will lead you right. Um, it was channeled, I think, in, um, I think the, it, it, the future of spirituality doesn't include channeling, I believe. Mm -hmm. I think channeling is a way of the old world, the old consciousness, where we needed to remove ourselves from physicality in order for a higher vibration to come through. I think in the future of spiritual experience, that won't be necessary. There's more of a merging. I don't consider that the sovereign way was channeled. I consider myself the author of it, but I do, I do consider it a divine gift to the world. And I do consider that this was done in partnership with divine knowing, with genius mind. So, uh, and I believe that the way of the world will be more so that we won't be channeling things. We won't be bringing th things from another place into the world because it won't be necessary. Instead, we'll be birthing things from the very alchemy of our presence. So that's my thoughts on that, yeah. That's beautiful. So there's even less separation then from, from us and divinity. And, and on that scale, you, um, I guess the sovereign way would, would take typically people anywhere along the scale, but typically above four or 500 uh, is, is what sort of the people who are attracted to it are on that scale. And, and how, again, do you, do you measure it? Sorry, you know, I'm a little stuck on that, but um, just curious, how, what tools do you use to measure it? Yeah, the, the, the most commonly used tool to calibrate consciousness and energy is kinesiology. Applied kinesiology, as in kinetics, as in energy, is a way of muscle testing and using your own cellular consciousness to tap into knowing that's beyond your intellectual archives. 
And uh, the cool thing about kinesiology is that it can be replicated. So anybody who hasn't read this book or that book can also get the same test results because they're tapping into the Akash or the data field that is beyond our, our manifest reality. So applied kinesiology, that's the way that, that these things are measured. Perfect. No, thanks. This has been super enlightening and informative. And I know I could talk to you forever, but I know, well, I mean, as long as you have time, but I also know John wanted me to keep this short. I'm just uh, if you had, I guess, normally I ask for final messages and about your business. We've covered your business, the community you've created, how you stepped into leadership and your dark night of the soul, if you will, the inner work you did before, spirituality, we had an amazing masterclass, so thank you for that. That was, uh, I love the visuals and the walking through uh, the steps and your definition of grace particularly struck and um, and mercy as well. And, and the way you highlight the importance of, of having a savior or, or defining or believing in a savior and what that can do for our personal lives. Uh, those those concepts all were, were beautiful, especially for me, the the grace triggered this uh, this movement in my heart. So um, I don't think we have time for the rapid fire. You covered most of it. Uh, it would be a whole range of modalities that are uh, typically, uh, you know, esoteric and, and, and you've covered all of them in various degrees. So just any, any final messages? Uh, typically I ask people what makes them the happiest, what makes Elizabeth the human the happiest in any given day. Uh, so we could just do the last couple of questions. So yeah, what makes you the happiest on any given day? All right. Well, I'll tell you about this one experience that I had when when I was homeless. And I woke up in the morning and I had such incredible pain in my neck from because the, the land that I had been sleeping on was slanted. And so all the blood had pooled around my head and it had it had really infected all the insect bites that I had around and in my ears. So I was in so much pain. And so I, I got out of the tent then and when my husband went to build a bathhouse out of cob, I tore down the tent by myself and then I got my pickaxe out and I leveled that stone. I leveled that stone myself. And I did it wearing my pretty pink hat with the flowers and my beautiful flowery dress. So I think the answer is that what makes me feel the best in any given day is knowing that, that I can choose beauty, no matter how hard, no matter how painful, no matter how horrible my reality seems to be, I can choose beauty and I can wear my prettiest hat and I can do what I need to do to improve my circumstances just a little tiny bit. And, uh, and I think my last words would be to challenge anybody to find a pretty hat and be bold enough to wear it. Because when you can see beauty in anything, then you have beauty in anything. And you really are then in the presence of God. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. It's been a real pleasure. Your, your words inspire and enlighten not just your followers, but your new, uh, your new uh, fan and uh, then the, um, the right word but but someone who's been deeply moved by the by your words and your presence so thank you i hope to share this in the next uh little while i i know we do a little namaste that's my uh um background i i truly respect the divinity that shines through within you so so thank you for sharing your light my pleasure namaste says i see the divinity in you right. and jesus says and i also see the little baby boy oh bless <laughs> Thank you.